everyone. Welcome back to the Market Chat. My name is Richard. Joining us today is our guest, Ryan Pierpont, one of the top performers in the 2020 U.S. Investing Championship. And he's continued that extremely strong performance in 2021, the gain of almost 200% through March 31st. Uh, Ryan, thanks so much for being here. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks a lot for having me, Richard. I'm, I'm very humbled and honored to be here. Um, I, I love your channel. You've, you've done some fantastic things, and it's a great place to have people come and and uh, learn a ton of new things from a ton of great guests. You've had amazing speakers, and which, by the way, thanks for putting me on after uh, people like Minervini and, and Fami and the likes. It's, it's kind of like going to a concert and seeing Led Zeppelin and Metallica, and then on comes like the Goo Goo Dolls or something, and then you could just see the audience scatter out of here. Like, who the hell is this guy? So, no, it's going to be awesome. I know. From, that. <laughs> I, I know from our call before that this is going to be great. So thanks so much for coming on, Ryan, and thanks for your time. Um, sure. Yeah, it's going to be great. And to start things off, I always like to hear a little bit about um, people's backgrounds and how they got interested in, in the markets in the first place and how you kind of found um, and built your own method. Sure. So I didn't really get into the markets until uh, after college. In high school, my mom and dad, so I, I was in high school right around the, the dot-com boom in the late 90s. And so my mom and dad were always really looking at it. And um, I got to college and I, I love video games and and uh, computers in, in, in high school and growing up. And, and I ended up going to, to Santa Clara and right in the heart of Silicon Valley. And I was like, I'm gung-ho going into computer science. And, and my first semester there or quarter there, uh, yeah, I was staying up till like 3 a.m. in the morning looking for a missing semicolon and like 30 pages of code. And, and I was playing baseball at the time too. Nice. And, and uh, I was just like, and all these other kids in the class you know, they all had like these computer science classes in high school. And I'm just kind of thinking to myself, what high school did these kids go to? I went to a place where they had the bare minimum. But, um, you know, I sw quickly switched out of that, went into finance and the business realm. And um, they had some stock. Uh, one of my professors had a stock uh, class. He had us read, um, I think it was a random walk down Wall Street, the book. And mm -hmm. he kind of turned me off because he made it sound like, you know, the, the, the stock market's a big crap shoot. And, and, you know, I didn't know anything at the time. So I, you know, thought this guy knew what he was talking about. And, and I, I just kind of wasn't really interested in it, which gets me to a, a side point is I think, you know, it's really a disservice that we don't have some sort of at least personal finance or uh, investing curriculum in, in schools, even high school and college right. these days, a lot of, um, a lot of the content is really driven around, you know, theory, even if you learn about it in college rather than like application, it's just a lot of these guys have no clue what they're, if they're thrown into the real world, how, how to operate and how the market works. But um, I know you have a, a mentor, I think Dr. Wish who's really good in that regard, but um, it is something I'd love to see, but I don't know if they're going to switch the system. But, um, and so after college, I don't really get into, you know, buying any stocks until like a, a couple of years later, I, I graduated in 2005, um, maybe 2000, eight or nine or so, I, I dabbled in my first uh, few stocks, which is perfect time for that, right? You just get smashed right in the middle of a uh, massive market meltdown. And, you know, I was looking in um, Yahoo message boards, because uh, what better place to look for, for stock advice than, than with the, uh, the, the peanut gallery and the right, <laughs> Yahoo right. message boards, looking at penny stocks and, and you know the the thrill of of the cash, just watching these things go from two cents to five, and then losing your shirt the next day. And so I, I dabbled in a few, and I didn't have much money in it at the time. It was maybe a couple grand, a few grand, but um, so that didn't work out. And maybe fast forward to 2009 or 10. Um, you know, I, I found an old book I had from college, which is around options trading and mm -hmm. and strategies of options. I don't know how I came across it, but I started reading that and. And it, it really piqued my interest. And so I started digging into it a little more and, and, and I started option trading and, and I found a site online when I was doing some research. Um, it was basically like a, a service where they send you pics in the mail, not every night, but whenever they thought the market was set up for it. So again, this is right when the market was bottoming. And you know, I had the worst thing that happened to me and I'm glad it did was I had a really good first year. Right. Um, you know, I was just, waiting with bated breath for these emails to come through. They say price goes to this level, buy X amount of calls at this strike. And, and that's what I did. And, and I did really well. The market was moving off the bottom. And, and you know, so naturally, you know, you think you know what you're doing. And in reality, you have no clue. 
And what better thing to do after you've had a good stretch than say, oh, I'm just gonna push the pedal to the metal. And, and long story short, I, I spent the next four to five years, basically the, half, the next half decade, giving all those year one gains back and, and learning my market tuition, yeah. or paying my market tuition. And, and I really think, I mean, as terrible as it sounds, that is the key to success is getting your ass handed to you because there's no better teacher than, than losing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, winning teaches you very little in life. It doesn't have to be around market, uh, yeah. the market topics either. I mean, if you win, great. That's what you're hoping to do. But if you lose, I mean, it teaches you a lot about yourself on, you know, how do you come back? How do you prepare? Are you going to give up? Um, so, so that was really when my journey started. Um, and, and I know I like the game, but I really wanted to, you know, learn more about it. And, and so that's right around the time where I found, um, you know, O'Neill's How to Make Money in Stocks. And I read that about a million times over um, trying to, you know, O'Neill's the goat. Everybody knows yeah. that. And, and the guy came and developed his own system and method. And, and, and so I, I was really kind of honing in on that. And that was around the same time I, I you know, ran into, you know, who eventually became my mentor and, and you know, Dan Zanger with his chartpattern.com uh, yeah. website. And, you know, I got to, you know, interact and meet, with, meet him and, and his right-hand man, Randy, who's amazing. Um, so those two, I really started to, you know, learn my bearings from. Um, so a lot of my method and my style is, is based on the whole, you know, swing trader, O'Neill, position sizing. Um, I'm a horrible day trader. I, you know, if you want to lose money or if you want to lose your money, give it to me and I'll day trade for you. But, uh, um, but Dan, he was great. I, the thing I loved about Dan was, um, you know, he's no nonsense, uh, no fluff. He just tells you, you know, how it is. He's like, this game is really hard. You better put in the work or you're going to get smoked. Yeah. Um, which I think is a shame, you know, nowadays. I mean, some people are pretty transparent out there, but, um, you know, you see a lot of people on Twitter or social media. All you see are the, the gains and, and you don't hear anybody talking about the losses, which is part of my French fucking bullshit. Cause this game is one of the hardest things I've ever done. Yeah. Um, you know, if you see somebody that is giving you stock advice and they're not transparent, run 180 degrees in the other direction. Cause this, this, this is a game of failure. you you lose more than you win. I mean, some people maybe are break even at 50, 50, but um, like, for example, my batting average is roughly, you know, only 35% on average on a given year, even last year, um, you know, I was losing more than I was winning, but you got to keep those losers small and, and, and let those winners run. It's like investing one-on-one, but I think a lot of people starting out have the opposite, um, the opposite mindset where they get a winner and, and, oh, I don't want to lose this profit. So they sell it right away right. and they cut it short. And then if they have a, a loser that's going against them, they they adjust their stops to lower. Oh, I think it might bounce back here. And so, you know, they, they just, they refuse to sell. Yeah. And it's just a never ending spiral downhill. So um, anyhow, so I, I was really diving into Dan's old newsletters. I, I looked at every single one of them multiple times since when he started and, and really wanted to learn chart patterns and be an expert at that. And, and you know, what's a cup and handle? What's a you know, descending channel, ascending channel, and what are bearish patterns, what are bullish patterns, and, and basically not only learning the pattern, but, you know, interpreting what that means, because it's right. one thing just to look at it and say, oh, this is a couple of handle, yeah, but what's the psychology behind it, or, um, you know, it's basically monitoring supply and demand, uh, these charts are basically displaying human emotion at its finest, and it, it's the same from the 1800s, whenever the stock market was first invented, till now, you know, there's a whole saying that, um, you know, these patterns repeat themselves because one thing never changes and that's human psychology and the emotions of it, the euphoria, the fear, um, all these things repeat over and over again. And so, you know, as investors, it's our job to, you know, basically interpret what the market's doing. Um, we don't know for sure if it's going to work, but it's the idea of the game is to, you know, find an edge and basically you know, if, you're, if your edge is, I'm only going to buy bull flags in a, in a rising market and stage two uptrends, and that's it. I'm not going to touch the market at, at all. Um, so you're only buying out of bull flags. That's your edge over time. It's not about one trade, two trades. It's about, you know, the next 500 in the series, right. stacking the, the odds in your favor. Um, so, you, so you operate like a casino, if you will. So instead of, 
getting taken to the house by the casino. You are the casino and, and setting your odds and having rules and, and staying disciplined and following them and not getting off track. And, and, um, and so that was, so I spent a couple of years doing that and I, I was gung ho on basically learning the patterns and for a few years. And, and even this is like 2013 I, or so, and I was, I was still losing money. And I think in 2013, the S&P, if I'm not mistaken, broke out of like a 13 year base and it was impossible to lose money. And dumb, dumb over here was probably the only person in America that, that lost money that year because, you know, I didn't have a plan. I, I was undisciplined and you would make money and then you would give it right back. And we were trading all the time, every day, every week. And I was trading like the market was going away forever. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to buy this, 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 and that today. And, and so you'd make money in the good times. And then, you know, after a big move, what does price usually do? It consolidates or it pulls back. And I was still buying in those periods. And so you're just digging yourself a hole. So you're not making any progress. You're so the, the name of the game is compounding. Once you set your edge and, and define your, your, your strategy, whatever that is, there's a million ways to skin a cat in this game. And, yeah. um, you know, once you have that defined, it's really the name of the game is being disciplined and compounding. And, you know, as you, as you know, there's only really a couple, two or three good times a year where things work in your favor. The rest of the time you're playing defense and, and, um, and, you know, your cash preservation mode and, and, you know, defense still wins championships, you know, glass Tampa Bay bucks, right. You know, they, uh, they had a stellar defense this last year. And, and it's true. You, you, you don't want to time is money, right? So you don't want to make money and then give it back. And then, so you're back to square one. So then when the good times come again, you're just digging yourself out of the hole. You just dug yourself into instead of compounding the right. gains. Right. So like, like all those the successful traders say you want to compound gains, not compound mistakes. And so, so I spent the, you know, four years, you know, hell bent on learning the technicals where I should have been, you know, hell bent on that. Plus learning, you know, the, the psychology of it, um, the emotions that are involved with this, because this is an emotional game, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. um, you really, it took me, you know, half a decade, six years or so to put the whole package together and, and, you know, just operate like a mindless, emotionless robot and, you know, you, you know, your patterns, you know, your, your strategy, whatever it is, you see price go through your buy level, you know, you buy, you see price go through your stop, you sell, that's it. No questions answered. So it took me a long time to, to realize the psychology of it. Um, and many people will tell you, you know, technicals and fundamentals are 10, 20% of it. And the rest is just you versus yourself getting in your own head. Um, do you buy a stock? Do you go in with a set stop loss? Um, and you buy a stock and it works for you and it's breaking out and it has one bad day, like one reversal bar and you panic sell, even though no stop was hit. And then the next day you see a gap up and it just keeps going without you. I mean, how many times does that happen? It happened to me a million times yeah. and I'm sure, you know, some folks have had that as well. So sure. you're not following your plan, right? So um, learning to master your plan uh, was huge for me. And, and that comes with confidence and, and to build confidence, it's just experience, right? So you're going to go through, um, and paper training is horrible, by the way, because it doesn't teach you anything. You need to get skin in the game. You need to take the heat. You need to feel the pressure. And um, again, you got to get blasted. <laughs> it's, it's sad to say, but you got to get blasted to really make any progress. And and I certainly got blasted those four or five years after that first year. And it was really a wake-up call, like, man, Ryan, you suck. <laughs> you mm -hmm. need to... Uh, you need to step up your game and, and, and learn. And, and I think it's step one is finding a mentor and, um, you know, find something that's com you're comfortable with. You might go through a period of, you know, trying to find, you know, where you're good at, or are you going to buy pullbacks into a 50 day? Are you going to buy yeah. breakouts a la, you know, O'Neill? Um, so it's all, you know, based on personality and everybody's got a different personality. So just find uh, what suits you. And, and go for it. Sorry, that was a really long-winded um, introduction and I hit many things, sorry. <laughs> no, no, you, you covered you covered a lot there that I definitely want to dive deep deeper into. And yeah, I completely agree about paper trading because I think um, the, the, the first account I funded, I think it was like $500 in Robinhood and I lost $2 and I was like, oh, that hurts, man. It went down. <laughs> um, but yeah, until you've got real money in the game, no, no matter what amount that is, like it's going to feel different than just a paper trade account. So I completely agree with, with you on that one. Um, 
first diving a little bit into uh, a kind of other resources that helped you along the way outside of how to make money in stocks. Were there any books that really helped you? Um, I know, I know you're really focused on, on the mindset and psychological side of things. So I, I know you're going to mention one uh, that, uh, that, that we talked about earlier, but yeah, are there any books that you really uh, find helped you a lot along the way? RIP, Mr. Douglas, he was the man. Um, you know, it's, I, I can't stress enough to people starting out. I mean, many people have been around the block, uh, maybe watching this, but uh, for people starting out, it really does come down to psychology and, and managing emotions and, and, and listening to your training, right? So, you know, the thing I love about Mark, like one of the best things he had said was, you know, look at your last, string, your last 10 trades, like, how have you done? Are you, you know, batting 80%? Great, yeah. you know, the market's working, you can add more exposure. Um, but if you're 0 for 6, it's like you better stop and, and either the market's telling you something or your selection criteria is horrible, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so Douglas was great. Um, I think Weinstein's book, which is kind of old school, uh, but it still holds true, the stage analysis, stage one, accumulation, stage two, uptrend, you get distribution in stage three, and, you know, stage four decline. We've kind of... It's, We've kind of been seeing that in, in some of the tech stocks. Now you've yeah. had some wide loose price action, stage three um, distribution the last couple of months. And now there could just be starting uh, a stage four decline. Who knows? It's, it's still open for debate, but um, that was a great book and great resource. Um, what else was out there? So uh, Darvis, Livermore, all the Livermore books are great. Darvis, How I Made Two Million in the Stock Market. Um, you know, I thought Brian Shannon's book was really good on technical mm -hmm. analysis, you know, aligning multiple time frames, not just looking at, you know, an hourly chart if, oh, there's a bullish pattern on an hourly chart, but if you look at the weekly or daily, even you're just kind of in a strong downtrend and, and aligning your, your, um, your time frames was great. Um, Intervening's books are awesome. Um, the thing I love about Mark is, you know, it's, it's the guy was an eighth grade dropout, mm -hmm. um, but he loved the market and he was hell bent on, on succeeding. And he was either going to succeed or he's going to die trying. And, and it's really not so much a book about, um, sure. There's, you know, good tidbits about stock, um, stock references in there and, and patterns and BCP and all that, but it's really a book about perseverance and, and not giving up. And, and his mindset book is great too. Um, so his stuff is a great read. It's an easy read. Um, you know, it's a fun read. He's got some great points in there. And so that was a great set of books as well. I mean, there's a million others that I can name off that I'm probably forgetting, but um, you know, those core core books really kind of helped. And I'm still learning some, uh, reading some today and you can never stop learning, right? And yeah, um, but there's, I mean, I think today is, people today have it easier than ever in terms of, you know, your channel, which has fantastic content on it. Um, the amount of books that are out there, YouTube videos from, mm -hmm. you know, whoever, um, it's just amazing. I mean, people back in, I wasn't trading back in the seventies or sixties or eighties, whatever, even in the early nineties, it's like you had to get out the old, you know, graph paper and, and bring out a, a newspaper, which aren't even in existence really today and, and start plotting out on a piece of graph paper, you know, price, price charts. And I can imagine doing that today. Like, 90% of people, you know, the, the, the people that aren't really passionate about it would just not even do it. So, I mean, the, we really have it easy today, I must say. And, and um, so there's a lot of great resources out there and, and um, you know, find whatever, you know, suits your style and, and just go for it. Absolutely. And, and speaking of Mark, um, I mean, he has his own YouTube channel where he goes over trades that he's done. So yeah, there's a ton of great resources out there. I completely agree. Um, so, so getting into mindset, because this, this I've just come to realize talking to these great traders, um, this is the, the one thing that they emphasize. They, they, they say you can learn the technicals, you can learn all of that, but until you really master yourself and um, become disciplined and follow your plan, you're not really going to make that progress. Or even if you do, you're going to give it back. So what do you think the most important things when it comes to discipline, psychology, mindset, what are the most important things um, for becoming a great trader? I think it really just, boil, I think I mentioned it earlier, but it just boils down to ex experience and yeah. this stuff takes time. I, I gotta say, I mean, I'm now 11 years into this. I was worthless my first six years. <laughs> um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, this is my passion in life. I mean, yeah. outside yeah. my friends and family, 
I basically dedicated my life to learning this game. Every free, you know, moment I have, I'm, I'm learning, picking apart charts, um, you know, reading books on psychology and, and it's like, how bad do you want it? Right. You have to go through the ups and downs and, and know the cycles. Um, you know, some people haven't gone through a nasty bear cycle until, you know, last year, um, you know, 2000 bear market. I wasn't trading around then or investing, but I lasted three years. I mean, can you imagine how many people were probably trying to pick bottoms in that thing? Like even last year, um, you know, I got off track. I, I'm human. There's, yeah. there's no such thing as a guru in the market. There's just people that are more prepared than others, I would say. Because yeah. um, if you're not humble, then the market will just find a way to slap you across the face. So um, like last year, like in the March decline, you know, you find a couple of signals or whatnot. Yeah, you know, I think the market's getting close to bottoming. So you start initiating a few positions. And then you wake up the next morning to like a 5% index gap. <laughs> like, what are you doing, idiot? So you have to catch yourself and, and get back into your lane. And I do dumb stuff all the time. Yeah. Um, not as much as I used to, but, you know, it's still there. You, you just have to catch yourself and, and know that, you know, this stuff takes time. It, it, yeah. it takes years and years and years to put the package together. So if you're just starting out within the last couple of years and you're not making progress, that's completely normal. Um, you know, if you have the drive and the will to want to succeed and then you love it and don't ever give up, um, that's the lack. Because the, the, the time when you do want to give up is right around the juncture where you're starting to turn the corner, but you, you, you've kind of thrown the white towel, if you will. But um, yeah, so, so experience and, and, and that kind of brings upon confidence because I think mental capital, you hear people talk about that, that's way more valuable than monetary capital. Because if you don't have mental capital, uh, you lose confidence in your ability. Um, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, when I first, was first starting out, I questioned everything. I'm like, is this even doable? Um, you know, do I have what it takes to, to make this work? And, and you go through a cycle of self-doubt and, and you just have to go through the entire range of emotions. And like I said, this just takes, many years to, to master. So don't get flustered if you have to go through all the different cycles, right? And you have to go through booms and busts. And, and the more you see, the more confidence you get. And, you know, once you have the confidence, um, then you can start to, you know, like if you go through a drawdown, let's say, um, and you're feeling kind of down and, you know, I've lost like five in a row. Um, you know, my mental mindset is, is not so great right now. Uh, the market, uh, this market's been pretty tough. I'm not going to yeah. lie. I've been worthless the last two months, like January, February were really good. Um, I would say March was good. Although I didn't really participate much. I, I would try some trades and, and they work and you have a smile on your face and then the next day just, slap down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm, like I said, I'm a horrible day trader, so I'm not very quick. So you either got to be quick. Uh, this is like a quick in the dead market, right? So yeah. if you're quick, you can do really well, but it's just not my style. I'm more of a wait for the, the right pitch, the fat pitch. Um, but once you have, you know, your, your confidence down, um, you, you can know like, hey, if, even if I'm going through a, a rough pit, patch, I, I have the ability, I know deep down, I have the ability to get myself out of it, but you have to be patient. So yeah. let's say you lose five, six, seven in a row, market's hard. Um, it's good to maybe take a few days off, I would say, and, 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 Go exercise, go spend time with your family, um, keep your mind fresh, uh, get away from the screens and just hit the reset button. Yeah. And I think that kind of helps me too. Um, I'll do that from time to time and take like a, a few days off. And if I'm just, just doing horribly and, and, you know, you need a reset button to hit and, and you can start seeing things a little more clear. Um, once you come back to your desk, you have a better mindset. Um, I would say too, you know, you don't want to be like all in on your first position back either, even though your mindset might be great. You're like, okay, I'm ready to go. You got to ease into things. I mean, you should be easing into things to begin with. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're initiating a position, pyramiding in, because, um, you know, Mark talks about it, other folks talk about it, because you're, you're trading your, if you get stopped out in your initial position, who cares? It's a small partial position. But once you get traction on that first one, there's another supplementary ad point. You can start adding more exposure as you're doing well and, and trading your best, your biggest when you're trading your best. You know, all the, the, the greats talk about that. And yeah. um, so that's important, but, um, and, and revenge trading too, if you're like psychologically, if you're down in the dumps, um, do not revenge trade. Cause I've done that. I've done every, I've done every dumb thing in the book, but yeah. um, 
because when you revenge trade, uh, it's just a nasty emotional cycle. So let's say you lose your down 10% off your highs in the account. And you know, most people's first inclination is, you know, I want to get it back yeah. right away. Yeah. And so they go aggressive on some sort of average, you know, setup. They lose on that. So like, oh, now I got even more to gain back. And so they double the amount, trying to get it all back at once. I think, I don't know, maybe, I mean, I'm not, I'm getting older, I'm not that old. But I think the younger generation, uh, most people anyway, it's it's all about instant gratification. Yeah. Um, there's no patience. And this mm -hmm. game requires a ton of patience. It doesn't happen overnight. You can make money overnight. You can make a lot of money overnight. But you can also lose all that money twice as fast. So I think realizing that this is a marathon and not a sprint um, will kind of help with your mindset. It's not about, like I said earlier, the, the next trade or two trades or three trades. It's about the next thousand trades. Like anybody can make money in a good market. Last year, the market made me look good. I'm not any smarter than I once was. Um, you know, I was ready for it at times. I still did dumb stuff last year. Mm -hmm. um, and same with the, the first part of this year. Um, you know, the market, you know, made a lot of people look good. I'm sure there's like thousands of people across the country that did way better than I even did. But anybody can make money in a good market. But what I'm usually most proud of is when the market gets tough. And can you keep that? money. And I think a lot of people are probably finding out um, that did well last year. Like I had my wife, for example, um, she has like these, her friends on Facebook and last year they're coming out of the woodwork, people from high school that she didn't, they probably never even seen a stock in their life. And they're posting, you know, stock, you know, screenshots of like, Oh, look at my stocks are doing so good. And, and I, it's terrible to say, but you got to feel for some of those people because they're probably finding out uh, the last couple of months that this is, this is a normal market. Last year was the exception, yeah, not the rule. I mean, that's like a once in a decade, once every two decades kind of market. It's great to take advantage of when you get them. Um, but just know, you know, when we have massive moves like that, it's going to be a rough, a rough ride uh, for the next uh, foreseeable future. And, and you got to digest gains and, and kind of work off some of that excess fluff. So sorry, I'm getting off track. But back to your psychology point, it's just really, it, it takes time, be patient. Um, just know, you know, know who you are. Um, don't don't style drift right. So, you know, if you're a breakout trader and your and your trades aren't working, there's an off season for every single strategy out there. And so, don't force it when when the market's telling you otherwise. So, um, so hopefully that's somewhat helpful. Sorry, I'm getting off track again. No, no, that was great. I like all the baseball references you're throwing in there. <laughs> um, well, even like speaking of another yeah. baseball reference, like yeah. just think of this, right? So. So my, my accuracy is usually terrible, but I I, I'm, I I will cut a stock like that. It's like, trust your trust your stops, not your stocks, right? right. Uh, is the old saying I love. But if you're only hitting, you know, 30% of your trades, you can still make a killing, but you got to have the math work out, right? You can't be averaging 8% losers and 8% winners. You'll end up in the poorhouse, right? Right. So, um, but if you transfer that to baseball, you know, if you're hitting, if you're failing 70% of the time, you're in all-star uh, uh hall of famer right so mm -hmm. um you can still make it work so like people like doctors i think they make they probably make i mean maybe there's some good ones but there's probably they probably make terrible investors because there's a need to be right all the time oh i need to have a high accuracy yeah. uh, i need to be proven right where that couldn't be farther from the truth um you could like i said get smoked in the accuracy department, but your P&L is still profitable. So, but it's just all comes down. It's just one big math game and, and knowing your stats are important and, you know, average loser and, and winner and, and all that comes into play too. So it's just one big, uh, it's just one big package. It takes time. That's what I got to say. Absolutely. And do you do any kind of journaling to kind of keep your mind right and stay in touch with how you're personally feeling? I'll, I'll be honest and say, I don't do it as much as I used to, but when I first started out and, and there's no excuse for that, by the way, I, I, I need to pick it up again, but I did it a ton when I first started, uh, I used a program called Edgewonk, yeah. um, which you can use to kind of track and, and all your trades and stats. And um, I would say that it's one thing to basically say, like make a couple mistakes in a row and say you're in your head, I'm not going to do that again. I know I won't. And then two weeks later, you're making the same mistake again versus putting your trades in the journal, looking at the mistakes. And I think there's something about seeing a visual yeah. and staring you straight in the face. I think that sticks in your brain a little more like, 
oh, what the hell was I thinking that day buying into, you know, a triple top with tons of distribution up here, you know, I think it's a critical when you're starting out. And even now, like, like I said, there's no excuse for me not doing as much as I, I have in the past, but um, you need to know, you know, what your trading is telling you. I mean, if you're, if you're only, you know, average, if your winners are only averaging, you know, 5% and your, and your losers are at like three or 4%, there's very little uh, margin for error in the accuracy department. And um, so I think it's, it's good to go back. And even like at the end of the year, I'll usually go back and not in a whole great detail, but look at the winning trades yeah. that, that did well. Hey, what did I do? Right. Cause I think that's good for, you know, to build your own confidence, not to give yourself a pat on the back, but just, you know, the, this game is hard, right? So you got to make sure you, you've got the confidence intact and also to go back and look at the dumb stuff that you did too. And, and, you know, I, I couldn't even tell you half the winners I had over the years. I remember all the ones that stunned though. Like I remember I was on um, a few years back. I forget the stock was STNE. It was some sort of Brazilian financial company maybe. And it had broken out from like a little IPO base and, and I bought some and, and I, you know, had a decent sized position and, and I was on vacation in Hawaii and visited my father-in-law. And one morning I woke up and it's brutal trading in Hawaii, right? It's like 3 a.m., 3.30 when the market opens. And, and, and I woke up and the thing was down like 30% overnight. I forgot what the news was. And I was like, yeah. oh my God. And it was like in the beginning of my trip. And so it basically ruined the rest of my trip for me because that's all I could think about was, you know, this stupid loss I took. But yeah, the, lo the losses stick, but, um, <laughs> but it is, it is crucial, I think, um, you know, to, to know, it tells you what your, your training is telling you, you know, how you're doing, what you're doing well at, what you're terrible at. And, and so I think it's, it's, it's really good for, for folks to go back and, and do some post-trade analysis. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, sp speaking of uh, losers sticking, I think I'll remember Fastly last year, it caught me on the, on the first earnings gap down. I, I built up a position pretty nicely. And then when they, they lost TikTok, it had that gap down. I was also in that. So I'll remember that and, and learn to not have such a large position in something that's so extended. I had forward. my, uh, I, caught, I got caught with my pants down on the remaining shares I had in that too. So you're in yeah. good company. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, well, perfect. Um, let's get a little bit more into your, your investing or trading strategy. Um, in general, you've talked about your batting average a little bit, but what's your kind of overall time frame? What's your kind of average hold period for a winner, a loser? Um, and can you talk a little bit more about your stats if you, if you know them in the ballpark, you know? Yeah, I would say um, I need to do a better job of uh, holding on to winners longer. So I'll, I'll catch a good swing for a few weeks. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of hard to answer because this is something I think you pick up over time because it's almost like an art where, you know, you get a fast 20, 30, 40% move and you just look at the stock's history and you can just tell that it's ripe for like a month rest, two months yeah. of rest. And, but last year was very interesting in the fact that, you know, you should hold a stock after being up 30%, but you had the luxury of just selling everything and then moving on to the next thing. Yep. The next day, there's like four more bases breaking out and you just rotate your money into that. That thing moves up, you know, 10, 20, 30%, you know, ring the register next. Um, so last year was like a, a stock buffet, if you will, but, but in a normal market, um, you know, I, I think one of my goals is, is trying to hold on a little longer. So there's, um, there's something that Randy talks about, you know, Dan's right-hand man that I love. It's like the runner concept, um, you know, that goes back to like the Paul Tudor Jones and it depends on the market too, but you know, Paul Tudor Jones always talks about, you know, five to one risk reward ratio and all that. Um, so, you know, so once you have your initial target, you know, hit, you can reduce some and then leave a runner, even if it's only like 10, 20% um, that's remaining, you may, you may look at it and be like, this doesn't even like move the needle much. Yeah. And, but you know, all those runners over time, over the series of a thousand trades, they add up. So um, you may think something's done and topping and you sell all of it. And next thing you know, it's up another 50%, but you've got none. So, um, you know, Mark talked about it. Other folks have talked about, you know, the easy thing is just to sell half because that way, if it goes back down to you, you're glad you sold some, but if it keeps going, you're annoyed that you don't have all of it, but at least you still have some. So it's a win-win situation, right? Um, but, you know, holding for the big, uh, the big winner, like Jim and, and some of the other folks talk about, you know, the average true market leaders, you know, 98 point whatever weeks. 
Um, I think you need to know what kind of market you're into. So when we're coming out of a big bottom and the indexes after they've cratered or had a huge correction, you know, the Russell's correcting 30 or 40% like it did last year and, and the market's just bottoming and things are starting to emerge. It's a little, little easier to hold for the long haul um, in that type of situation. But when we get pretty extended, like kind of like we are now on a longer term basis in equities, it, you gotta be quick. And, and so if you're trying to catch, you know, a longer term move, um, I think it's a little more difficult up here. Uh, and that's what, I, that's what I tried to do like in March, you know, I was still thinking it's the normal market we've been in. And it took me a little while to realize that's just not the case. And so um, it's kind of a, it's just kind of a fine art, if you will. You just learn it over the, over time. And I, I can go through a couple of examples of this um, in the charts later on that kind of show, hey, you can just tell by looking at the eyeball test tells you it's short term extended and may need some rest and, yeah. and so on and so forth. So, yeah, perfect. And um, yeah, I, I definitely want to go into the technicals and see see like how you analyze all of that. Uh, but first, I, I want to ask you like uh, in, in terms of overall stock selection, are you very classic can slim or are you are you more in terms of just price strength is something you look at? Yeah, so I think it, it's important for people to know that, um, you know, like as Brian Chan always says, it's like only price pays, right? So you can have like a million different indicators, um, you know, stochastics or yeah. whatever. Like all those are, to me, they're like worthless. It's it's price action and it's volume. Even volume is second secondary because you could have a breakout and, you know, maybe it's not on high volume and it maybe breaks out for three days, but it's on like light volume. And people are like, well, it's only on like half the daily volume. It's like, who cares? Like volume doesn't pay you, price does. And sometimes the volume you don't see coming through until like the fourth or fifth day of the breakout, then it starts taking off. So, um, but I think, you know, if it, look, I'm not trying to poo poo all those other things. If it works for you, awesome. Um, but for me, I'm a, you know, old school price action volume. And that's it. Like, I don't even look at, like, I haven't watched CNBC or Bloomberg and that kind of stuff in years. Like that stuff's totally worthless to me. Mm -hmm. I, my job is to interpret what the little bars up and down on the price chart are telling me. Cause each day, you know, those bars are telling a story and our job is to interpret right. what is that story telling you? Um, and it's just basically building a puzzle together each day, each day, those daily bars give us a new piece to the puzzle. And it's our job to, like I said, interpret what that's, what that's telling us. So, um, Sorry, what was the original question again? I was getting off track. I was, I was asking about stock selection. So no, that was- Oh, great, yes. But, so, but yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. Yep, so what I'll do is is on the weekends, um, and there's probably an easier way to do this, but so like on, on Saturday is like my NASDAQ day. So I'll, I'll sort from descending order all the way down, um, you know, from Am the Amazons all the way down and I'll stop it. So I'll go through every stock one by one and I'll usually stop it like 10 bucks stocks. I don't really do too much single digit stocks. I'll trade them, but- you know, they, they kind of lack institutional support. And, and so I, I, I just go one by one and I'm doing it that way. gives me a, a sense of what groups are doing well, what mm -hmm. groups aren't doing well. Um, so that's kind of step one is just purely looking at the, the technicals. Hey, this has a strong pattern. Oh, this is setting up a nice base that goes into my watch list. And so I'll do that Sunday. I'll do, you know, the NYSE stocks do the same thing. So I'll have like a master um watch list and it depends on the market like last year the thing was long <laughs> it was you know yeah. 500 to a thousand names you know this year it's, it's not very not very long at the moment it's full of crap i would never ever trade like energy and uh, <laughs> the other stuff but um uh so then from there i'll, I'll kind of comb through and, and try and identify you know what are the best looking technicals mm -hmm. um and then and then i'll start digging into the fundamentals so i'll go into market smith and, you know, it takes a little bit of time, but you start going one by one and saying, okay, this one has good earnings or, or rev or whatever. If it's a biotech, you throw out the window because those trade on completely different factors like, uh, you know, trial data yeah, or probably, whatnot. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so technicals lead me to the pond mm -hmm. and, and to whittle it down to the best names, I'll, I'll go to the, the technicals because, you know, O'Neill always talks about, I mean, the fundamental, sorry, O'Neill always talks about, it's all about you know, earnings, earnings drive, you know, all the historical great stocks of, of yesteryear, they're all massive earnings ramps and, and they had spectacular moves. And, and, and so that's what I like to focus. If, if the stock has super earnings, that's going straight to the top of my list. 
Um, so I'll have a focus list that I'll whittle down and, and I'll look at that for, you know, uh, maybe there's 10, 20 stocks on it. And I don't want to get too burdened down by looking at like too many things. Mm -hmm. So I will just concentrate on what I think are like the 10 or 20 best stocks in the market. And that's all I'm looking at the rest of the week. Um, I'm just trying to keep it simple. Like my motto is, you know, play dumber than a box of rocks, right? It's just price action, volume, technicals, fundamentals, and that's it. Um, try to keep all that noise away and, and outside because it's just distracting you. Um, it's like golf, right? If you're, if you're, uh, you visualize a shot and you go stand over the ball, it's like the longer you stand over the ball, like the more doubt like creeps in your head and you're like, ah. so it's like, no, just stick to what you know, don't listen to outside forces. And um, so, you know, once you have, you know, the 10 or 20 identified, um, then whatever comes out of the base first, we'll get, should get your money first. Um, and then uh, also just know that the stocks that you think are the best may not be the best. Like last year was hilarious because, um, you know, I, a stock you'd own would go up 10% and then you're pissed because the stock right next to it that you don't own went up 20%. And so you're like, why am I stuck with this dog that only went up 10% today, right? So, <laughs> um, but it's really the technicals lead me. Like a lot of times, you know, I wouldn't even know about a stock until I'm going through my weekend work and the thing just doubled. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, holy smokes, this thing's doubling on like massive volume. Um, and then that's when I put it on my watch list. And then you may need to wait a few weeks or a couple months for it to, you know, set up some sort of flag or new yeah. base. Um, but that's what attracts me is like the big volume. You know, it's not your mom and pop buying all the shares. It's the big boys and girls at the institutions that are creating all these patterns and, and driving and controlling and dictating the market, right? So um, so that's my, my first criteria. And even if a stock doesn't have super earnings yet, maybe they know something that we don't. Maybe they're, you know, the stock market's a, a discounting mechanism, right? right? So like, I think what people are seeing now is stellar earnings are coming out and that was already factored into the run-up, you know, last right. year and, and right. stocks are selling off on good news and it's just not uncommon to see that. But um, so yeah, long story short, technicals lead me to the water and, and I try and narrow it down from there if I have a long list based on based on earnings growth. Perfect. And uh, once you've got that, that those 10, 20 names, um, what's, what's your preferred setup, whether it's a breakout, pullback buy? Uh, how, do, how do you like to do that? And, and feel free to share your screen and, and give some examples if you've got some. Sure. Um, you know, so in general, like there's a saying, you know, the, the bigger the base, the higher in space. So if it's a bigger base, that'll get my attention. If it, like, like the last year, even when we were coming off the bottom, there weren't like a ton of well-structured bases, right? Yeah. So, and just know too, like if you're buying out of some two or three day consolidation, don't be surprised if that thing just gets whipped right back in your face. But the bigger, I mean, if you have a more structured, foundation it's like if you're building a house right um you can't build a, a big house without a big foundation so the same thing with a, a stock base you know if you want a massive move you need to make sure you have a nice foundation a big base right um that can kind of help propel um so i think you know bases with shakeouts as well yeah go to the top of my list um it's sad to say but you know the market's a zero-sum game mm -hmm. and you need to see people get screwed because yeah. it creates it creates fuel, and I, I can get into a, a couple examples, but um, I don't have a favorite pattern per se. But I'll say like an, an, I'll get into the charts in a second. Yeah. But the the entry criteria. So also what I found when I was first starting out, um, you know, learning the ropes, is you would see like a standard uh, buy area, like the standard breakout. Everybody and their mother sees it. Yeah. And so I was waiting, 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 and then you know the stock could already be up like twenty percent on the day yeah. running using all its energy into the breakout area. And then it would hit the breakout area. I'm like, oh, there it goes, there's my alert. And then you'd buy, yeah, not knowing any better. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's just common. So many games are played at the standard breakouts. So what I tried to do over time was you have to get creative and, and get into these things before they even get to that, that location, right? right? So the, the first buy for me might be a, um, like some sort of shakeout in the base and back in, um, you know, somebody got screwed and you, you, it pops right back in. So, so going back to the psychology, you know, part of it, it's one thing to look at it, but like, as an example, let's say you have like a horizontal base that's kind of vacillating back and forth and then price dips below, excuse me, and breaks support. And so, you know, people that were holding, maybe they stop out. Yeah. People that uh, were waiting for the stock to break down, maybe have short sellers come in 
and start, you know, shorting the stock. Oh, this is the breakdown. This is this is the start of the down move. And then you're down below the channel for a couple of days. And all of a sudden you pop right back in. So the people that were long and sold, now they're saying, oh, I got to buy back. Right. And, you know, the people that were short, they're like, oh, crap, I'm wrong. So they buy the cover. And then there may be people like sitting on the sidelines knowing exactly what's going on. So they come in and pile on. So it creates this nice vacuum. And, and that's when you get, you know, massive moves. It's like Brian Chan always says from false moves, come fast moves. And right. it's so true. When, when you see people get screwed on these shakeouts, it just can create massive fuel at times. And those are great buy opportunities. And so I started implementing, you know, that as like a first pyramid buy. And then, you know, once it starts to make its way back up towards, you know, the right side of the base after some low cheat area or whatnot, then you want to see it, you know, flatten out and then you can kind of start adding with the cherry on top um, standard buy pivot. But um, we can go into a couple of charts if you want. Yeah, go ahead and uh, share your screen. And actually, before we get into the setups, I think it'd be cool to go through maybe um, the QQQ or the NASDAQ from last year sure. and talk about kind of what you were doing at different time periods during the year, because it was definitely a, a interesting year to be a trader. All right. So where's January? So it was actually, you know, pretty interesting because the start of the year was great. Um, Cause we had, you know, nice moves and start the year nicely. And, and Tesla was, you know, going parabolic and, yeah. you know, everybody's kind of, patting themselves in the back. And, and so I, I would say like right around here, you know, I had a good start to the year. And then this was kind of like the first shot across the bow this day. Um, and, you know, I, there's no volume on this, but it was probably if you're a public spy on, on heavier volume. Yeah. And then we kind of got this little, you know, follow through day down, closing below that bar. And then we had the big massive gap down. I was kind of like, you know, another thing too is I'll, you know, draw a, um, just like chart pattern 101 so you can kind of draw like a channel here mm -hmm. and you know for the newbies you know rising channels are are a bearish potential setup i mean they're bullish as long as they're in the channel but they usually lead to downside most of the time at some point in the future and, and on the opposite side of the spectrum you've got descending channels or bullish potential bullish setups they're bearish as long as they're in it but um so anyway you get this nice long you know, channel gets broken, just gaps down. It, this is even like a one, two, three. You know, if you had, was the old trader Vic or whoever created that one, two, three um, um, technique where you you might break a channel, and that's kind of like the one. Then maybe you go back in it or vacillate around, and that's the two. And then and then the three is the breakout below that low. So you have the breakout to the downside, and it just you know you get smashed down. And I I I had some positions here. And I got smacked around a little bit. And so I sold and went to cash. And then I think it might've been this day here in early March where, you know, we were kind of, we had this naked reversal bar here. And then we kind of gapped, we had a, some nasty wick here this day, but then we gapped up and closed right the dead high. So I think I got involved this day in a few things. And then lo and behold, next day. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. That's what I was talking about earlier, the massive cap down. This is what I mean. Don't be a hero, right? We're in the middle of a, we're just in the start of a downtrend here. And, uh, you know, you want things to set up and it takes time. And, and so I was pretty worthless this whole ride down. I wasn't doing much other than, you know, losing money like everybody else maybe was. <laughs> and so, you know, we finally get, you know, exhaustion down here. You get this, you know, they're, it's almost like an island reversal, naked reversal back up. And then this day, you know, after this gap, we have an island gap here. So, you know, there's yeah. a little island here for folks that aren't familiar with that. So that is kind of like your first higher low. So that's your first clue, maybe. Hey, we're closing out on the highs of this day. Maybe I should start looking at certain things and, and I can get test the waters, even if it's a small position size. This mm -hmm. is kind of telling you, like, the, the tides may be changing. Like, look at this. This is a pretty massive move down. Yeah. And at the worst, you know, at least to some sort of short-term retracement, maybe to like a 61.8 fib or whatnot. Yeah. Um, but when you get these massive moves down, it takes a lot of time to repair and build out. You would kind of veed up, but then even when you get back, you need to kind of build out the right side a bit. So actually, I didn't even really start, you know, I had traction the first part of the year and, and I got spanked around a little bit trying to catch 92 bottoms incorrectly down here. <laughs> and then, you know, it, it propped its way back up. And so, you know, a lot of people probably didn't start making traction until, you know, May, June timeframe. And this is when, you know, some of the leaders like Lavongo and, yeah. and some of these other stocks are trying to, you know, isolate themselves and separate themselves, the Teslas and, and whatnot. And 
And so from here, it was just, um, you know, if you survive this, the rest of the year was, was pretty easy. I mean, maybe there's some spills and chills along the way. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it was basically straight up from there. So, and the thing about indexes too, so I don't look at them a, a ton. There's a couple of instances where I, where I do. So if we're in bear mode like this, mm -hmm. I don't even really bother looking at the indexes because your job as, as, as a, you know, investor is to, that's when you should be looking for relative strength, yeah. what things are bucking the trend. Um, you're, you're looking for new potential leadership, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, by definition, leaders are going to lead. So by the time the indexes are done bottoming, you know, leaders are long gone, right? But kind of like now, on the flip side, if we're getting pretty extended and, you know, the indexes are up against like massive channel lines or overshooting massive channel lines from months ago, then you kind of know my new buys may not work so well. And, and so you're a little more hesitant to, to go as hard as you would into a stock. Um, so those are the times I, I mean, I look at them all the time, the indexes, but when we're cratering like this, I don't even put them on the screen. It's just your job is to look for new leadership. And but when we get extended on the indexes, I'll start, you know, taking some notes to myself, like, hey, this this may be tougher for new buys and some, yep. some stocks may buck the trend, but you know, you, you definitely want the wind at your back. Um, it definitely helps with your stock, uh, stock performance. So, um, so if we kind of get into some names, so Tesla um, was the gift that that kept on giving last year. Yeah, for sure. Uh, for most people, so so here's the January run, and you can kind of see too that we had a parabolic blow off. Um, you know, volumes getting huge. The, so usually the 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 start of the move and the end of the move usually have the biggest volume, right? And so you can just tell the angle. You know, just parabolic as can be. Gap down, come back up to the double top, and then it was. Good night, Irene, from there. Um, so this was the first day where it kind of poked above the channel. So you're like, okay, it's trying to stay of a comeback here. You can almost even draw like a descending line right here. And then this next day, it gaps up above it. But yeah. this is kind of your standard, um, your standard one, two, three slash turn pivot, if you will. And and on this day here on the on the ninth, it, it poked its head above, but it didn't really do it with much vigor. Yeah. And, and this is what I mean too, where you don't see like volume until like a couple of days later, possibly. And then like the day after it was like, pow. So that was, that was your, you know, cue to, to get active at least to some degree. And then the next day it gaps up again. So you're like, okay, I might be onto something here. And then, so the rest of the time it, it's, it's kind of meandering around, basing around a little bit and just notice that the, there's a little gap test here, but it held, came back to like an inverse level here, mm -hmm. held again, almost like a, um, like a, they call it like a tweezer reversal bar, close on the lows, opens near the lows and then closes near the high of the day. And then it starts to build the right side of the right side of the base and flatten out a bit. Yeah. Um, then you can even buy out of this gap out of the descending uh, trend line. So there's multiple different buy points as the base is building. So that's why I was saying, you don't have to actually wait until this you know, standard pivot high is broken again, because look what happened. So it, it gapped up here, broke out. Everybody's probably cheering. Woo, we got, a, got the breakout. And, and then, you know, no shock. It's standard breakout levels where all the games happen. And so, you know, it's just basically games being played for two weeks straight. And if you're going to draw, you know, an ascending trend line here, you would get a shakeout right here. And then this day is still closing on the lows. And then this was the day where it held above the breakout, closed right at the highs of the day, right near – right near the descending trail line. And that's kind of telling you like, hey, this thing's getting ready to go. Yeah. And then the next day it gapped right at the line and you could just buy right at the open. I mean, it was perfect gap. And then it was just all she wrote from there. And this is kind of what I was, was straight up from, what is that? 200 to, to 350. And down here, by the way, I meant to mention, um, this is kind of when the, the earnings growth started to ramp up a bit as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people were like hating on Tesla for whatever reason. It's like, oh, they don't have any earnings. Now, there's definitely earnings coming through. Um, and I don't know why people you know, hate on Elon and like, can't you find like a better stock to short than the strongest stock in the market? But no, it's beyond me. But anyhow, so you get a massive move from, from 200 to, you know, 350. And again, this is the biggest, the biggest range with the biggest volume at the end of the move. And look at all this wick up here. It closed right here, all this wick. So it's telling you it's tired. It needs some time. Yeah. So, you know, you can reduce into this knowing it's going to take, 
you know, ideally a couple months for it to a month or two to, you know, base around a bit more. Um, and then you can you know move on to the next thing that's moving out and then come back and revisit. So I love these. So this, this, this here, they call, you know, for people not familiar, like a little H, mm -hmm. H pattern, like a lowercase H, and that's usually a bearish signal. And so, you know, it came back down, meandered around, put in the H and look where this bar closed right at the low of the day, pretty much. And so, you know, most people are like, well, this thing is going to be just coming down and this thing's going to roll over. And then I can't remember if this was the, um, it was either the S&P inclusion or the, the stock split, one of the two, I forget, or some sort of news hit that day. Yeah. And it just gapped up. I mean, it didn't even hit the line per se. I mean, it's best when it gaps all this crap and then just goes right over the line. But I mean, this day right here, I was just right at the open, I bought some. Mm -hmm. And even though it was in no man's land, because you just know the game. This is the first pullback after a breakout, by the way. Yeah. So you want to figure out, you know, does the stock you have, is it is it a, a beach ball in the water, as folks like to put out, or is it an egg and just crap itself? Had it gone all the way back down, then okay, no big deal. But again, you know, we just come out of a nasty bear market. And, you know, usually when you get a, a huge flush like that in the market, Obviously, when the the financial uh, markets are being undermined in like 08, 09, that's a different situation. But um, you know, an Asian contagion or or something like this, where you get a quick 20, 30, 40 percent move down in indexes, it's usually a buy signal. Um, I mean, you can't really buy unless you have a ton of Kevlar, just yeah. buying the, <laughs> knife catching. But I mean, this is the first pullback after a breakout, and then it just totally screws these people who had you know thought we're going lower and selling. And it was just a mass and it ended up closing over the bar and then it was just straight up from there. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can start, you know, O'Neill talks about, you know, just drawing, you know, I can get into a minute, drawing trend lines. And so you can start connecting the dots, right? So it makes its move. So this goes from, you know, uh, 300 to, you know, 500, another stellar move. And then it takes its time to base out again. And so you can start as you get the clues each day, you know, okay, maybe this is the start of an uptrend line. Um, you know, here is a shakeout little shake out with a line and a gap back up, but it stopped at prior resistance here. Then the next day, bam, yep. takes it out. We're off to the races again. Um, and then here's what I was gonna refer you. You can start just piecing together the puzzle. Here's the rising channel. Um, so then once you get over the rising channel, that's usually as O'Neill says, you know, a sell signal. And so you're starting to get, okay, maybe this is the end of the move here. Then you gap up the next day and you, you just run right into this prior trend line. Yeah. Uh, the old the old O'Neill overshoot gaps down the next day, kind of gathers itself back up to test again into a double top, and then boom, all she wrote. So, I mean, when I get these, you know, trend lines, you get the overshoot. I usually like to reduce into those, especially the bigger ones. I mean, if it's some small pipsqueak one, it's maybe not as important. But if you get a big one, um, it's good. I mean, it's not a massive move, right? So it's good to lock it in when you have it. Um, and then um, now, it's you know can't get out of its own way. There was a, a little you know, tight action down here. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of creating a new possible buy point, kind of a fake up here, meandered around this little flag. And notice the volume's kind of coming down a little bit. So price is tightening up. Mm -hmm. And then you could have bought out of here. I did buy some. And then the next day, pow, you probably had a smile on your face. And then, you know, right, right back to this prior support underbelly, kind of broke this recent downtrend line, faked above it, and then right back down. And that was all she wrote from there. And, you know, it's been channeling down and and it's starting to lose this descending channel. Whenever you lose a descending channel bottom, that's usually like something's not right with the market. Um, this mm -hmm. could be a fake out too. Who knows? Like today we, we saw, you know, reversals are trying to be staged. And so maybe this comes back in and, and maybe needs, you know, months more time. Um, but if you pull up a weekly on this thing, I mean, this thing's had a massive move. Yeah. Um, sorry for all the scribbles. But you can even argue maybe like if you're to duplicate this line here, it could be a potential bear flag. You get the parabolic move, move down, bear flag. So who knows? Maybe this goes lower from here. But, um, you know, I'm not really involved in this one right now. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much avoiding it. But last year, it gave you some pretty nice, pretty nice opportunities. For sure. And going back to that, um, the gap up candle, um, I think uh, it was at the H fake down, the gap up candle there. Yep. Um, how are you managing risk on a gap up? Because often uh, we, we see a gap up and then just reverses and we might even end up red on the day. So how do you basically pick your gap up where you you have confidence to buy or are you just watching it very closely in that opening five, 10 minutes? Excellent question. So 
so what happened this day, I remember vividly, I bought some at the open and within, within like minutes, it like started coming back down and old Ryan would have said, and this is where pyramiding comes in. You don't want to, yeah. you know, put your whole position size in right off the back. Cause what if it does come back down, then you're hosed. And so, and so what I did is I just bought a little bit and it started to come back down intraday and, and come against me. And so old Ryan years have passed would have panic sold. Um, and then shortly after it came back, it reclaimed the low. So I added a little bit more once it reclaimed the low. And then it started gaining steam. Volume was coming in. I added a little bit more. And this is before it even came to the, the line anyway. Yeah. And then by the time it crossed the line, it was kind of like the cherry on top and I was done buying. But that's where kind of experience and psychology comes into play because like I said, my old self would have panicked like right yeah. after I bought it at the open. I probably would have bought my entire position at the open. Mm -hmm. uh, it came back down. I probably would have sold all of it. And then it reversed course shortly after, which it did. And I wouldn't have bought it back because I would be too pissed and complaining in the corner pouting. And I would have missed this massive move. And so um, so when it comes down to like position sizing and risk too, right? You want to make sure that, um, you know, this is something, normally I only give it like maybe a half on a normal trade, maybe a half percent of total equity or yeah. maybe like a quarter. Even I, I chuck off my trades probably more than most people do, but um because it, again, if you, let's say you have 1% standard risk um, in terms of percentage of equity and you buy five things all at once and you all get stopped out, you're like, boom, instant 5% correction or, or right or drawdown yeah. in your account. So I think it's good. Another example of why to, to just pyramid in and, and just let the market tell you if you're right or wrong. Um, oh, another thing for newbies, never average down. You know, uh, Paul Tudor Jones always said, losers average losers. So, you know, if, if, if your stock is going against you, why on, on God's green earth would you add more to that position? So only do it as, as you're getting confirmation that your, your purchase was correct. So um, so again, it, it's just, this was just something, it's a special, this was a special situation. I was willing to give this a little more risk um, than the standard half percent. I was willing to give this one like 2% of total equity just because of the fact we had a massive correction. You know, this is like the first primary stage, like primary breakout um you know from a nice solid base i mean this thing was basing from february all the way to you know june yeah um you know it's a first pullback right after the breakout and so th this is just like a special situation um that that allowed me to say hey you know i'll take a little more risk on this one i'm not doing i'm not giving two percent risk to like some stubby little three-day consolidation and I'm, I'm buying out of it so <laughs> it just doesn't work that way but um this one was was a special name and a in a special market. And, and so you just kind of got to know, and that's where confidence comes into play. Again, yeah. like golf analogy, you don't want to sit here and, and, and question it. You have your stops in place in case it goes against you. So I already had that out of the way. You, you need to identify every scenario before you make the purchase as well. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to be doing that in real time. You know, if you trade biotechs, for example, um, you know, you buy something, you know, the question shouldn't be like, what if this gap's down 20%? Like what if this thing gaps down 80% tomorrow, like, what am I going to do? Am I going to lose sleep? Cause I, I'm just too leveraged in this thing. And so knowing all the scenarios in your head before, before you even place the trade is, is crucial. Um, so you need to do the homework and, and uh, speaking of homework, if a, if, tr if a stock is breaking out and it's not on your homework, I, I, I don't recommend people buying it because yeah. you get caught up in the moment. Um, you basically, you haven't done, given it enough time and, uh, due diligence to like digest the setup, digest the price action. You're just caught in the moment because you see something flying. There's bright colors that are like yeah. siren song, siren song of Odysseus luring, in you, luring you into the slaughter. So <laughs> there's rocket emojis going off on social media, on Twitter. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. So that was, so that was one. So fastly, um, so fastly when it first IPO, it kind of created this, this little range here. Um, and so this is kind of like the shake. I was talking about, you have your prior channel that's being defined and, and normally for IPOs too, they usually take, you know, some, like if you have a Google that might take, you know, a few days and the thing's off to the races, but normally you want to see, you know, price digest for six, 12 months on an IPO yeah. per se, the good ones don't wait that long, but um, you know, here's, a, here's a little shake. You could have bought the break of this trend line and it works up and it breaks out, but then you get the slam bar down here where it's on massive volume and it's not ideal, right? But it kind of re recovers and, and just not getting much progress. Yeah. And then it finally fails. 
I mean, I don't buy it over here, but um, so then it comes back up to retest the, the initial high gets rejected, bases around, doesn't even make it quite back up again, gets rejected, bases around, rejects again, comes back. This was like the final straw and then comes back close to it again, doesn't break it. And then here is the earnings gap, a massive volume. It just gapped all this junk. Like yeah. you could have bought right at the open, right at the line as like an initial buy. And then it was off to the races from there. And again, it kind of channels up more times than not. These, these rising channels will, will, you know, come back and correct. And also too, I would say, don't, you know, in terms of FOMO, like if you miss a breakout, don't chase because more time, even last year, the best market we've seen in years, so many things retested. Yeah. And like, here's a good example. Like if you're, if this was like a stock on your focus list and here's a prior high and you're watching this thing like a hawk, it can't, it didn't come down to the penny, but it came pretty close and it had a, a, a like a hot stove reaction, if you will, where if you're like, put your hand on a stove, <laughs> you know, you take it off really fast. That was the price action here. And so you could have maybe had like a, an initial entry if you missed it the first time here, it works back up. You know, if you were to extend this channel line up again, it, it ran into that and it kind of, you know, based out a little bit more, set up a new buy point right here. You could have bought here and then a super move right up to the century mark, round century mark, overshooting a, a rising channel. That's usually a good sell signal. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then all this, and since then you can kind of tell, like look how tight price was down here. Yeah. And then look how loose it's getting up here. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, as you can make big moves, like funds will start selling into, you know, the, the rookies that, caught the move well after the fact they see something move huge so they get excited and start buying and that's when the institutions are selling in but you know this is putting in a head and shoulders pattern and you know i find that head and shoulders patterns more times than not are good you know contradictory indicators like sometimes they'll work and actually break down but more times than not it's just too obvious they'll fail and this one failed um you know you had a rising channel here i don't know what the news was this day but you could have bought i think i bought some here because it's just eviscerating this channel i said you know, more times than not, these rising channels break down. This is an example of um, one where it didn't. I think if you go back and look at Chipotle when it first had its big move, it kind of had like a channel similar to this and it just ripped out of there and didn't look back. So there are exceptions to the rule. You just have to be wary of it. Um, so it went into new highs. Um, again, it kind of created a, another, you know, channel here. If you could duplicate this upper one for the bottom, it was kind of hitting its head, a little wiki up here. It didn't quite make it up here to the top, but it was pretty close. Mm -hmm. And so I, I started reducing uh, maybe on this day and then this day I broke the channel. I reduced a little more, but I still had, you know, a decent size and, and we all know the rest after this, this is brutal. So. <laughs> yeah. Same here. Yeah. I was expecting it to maybe flag out above, pull back to the top of the, the prior base and, and maybe keep going. But yeah, uh, I, I sold basically at right at the open, just, just took, took the hit, but yeah, that was a tough yeah. one, but a lot. Of, I think everybody who follows Canceling was in that one at the same exact time. Yeah, so. that we all we all paid our yeah. dues on that one. Yeah. <laughs> and since then, it's just been you know horrible. It's just going nowhere. Probably toast. You know, yeah. arf arf gross. And just done. Next. That's my favorite. You know, Dan taught me that's you know that your favorite word in the stock market should be next. It's like yeah. don't get married to these stocks. Um, you know, get while the getting's good get the heck out when price is telling you to get out and then look for the next one. You're always looking for the next one. So, so that was another example. Before um, you go on, uh, can I ask uh, you a question? Yep. Sure. Um, so, so in terms of um, number of positions, how do you determine that? Because um, some people are very concentrated. Some people are in 10 to 12. Um, that, that's very concentrated to some people. Some people are in 20, 25. How do you personally manage that? Excellent question. And it's an important question because I think this is how you need to, people need to identify what kind of investor they're going to be because you know you hear the whole adage oh diversification but i mean i'm not one to hold 20 stocks at one time i mean if you want to hold 20 30 stocks at one time you may as well just give your money to you know a mutual a nice there's tons of good mutual fund managers or money managers out there running these funds mm -hmm. that way you don't have to worry about it you'll get your 10 percent a year or whatnot and and just takes the pressure off you but you know i'm not in the 10 or 20 percent of your business. I'm in the, the business of dreaming big. And, and, you know, O'Neill always preaches it's most people think it's scary, but you need to be concentrated in the best names. You don't want to be concentrated in dogs, right? So yeah. you've got thousands of stocks in the market, you know, someone saying, Oh, there's a so-and-so dog XYZ stock basing out from a 52 week low. Meanwhile, there's a handful of stocks 
with um, new technology, super earnings that are sitting in blue skies, breaking out of super bases. It's like, why in the hell would you put your money into something, you know, sitting at a 52 week lows versus these, these amazing stocks that are busting out, just breaking out and starting their moves. So I concentrate like last year, the most I ever had was probably six names open at a time. Mm -hmm. um, but I like to keep it. I like to keep when the, the times are good. I mean, that's when you really need to put the pedal to the metal after you've gotten confirmation from your first initial pilot buys and things start working in your favor. That's when you can start, you know, putting the pedal to the metal and, and things are working. You're in the right names. You've done your homework. Um, and I think too, some people will be happy with, like they could be in a leading stock and, they, and, and I've done it plenty of times. They could be happy with a gain of like 20% and then they sell it or most of it. And then they, they look for a new name to buy. Mm -hmm. But more times than not, you, the best stock in the market might be the one that you already own. So yeah. you just have to be patient with these things and, and just trust your research. You've done the homework, you've put in the time um, and you just have to be patient. Um, people are too quick to jump back. I mean, in this, the market, the last two months we've had to jump back and forth, but, um, but if we're in a normal, you know, market, where we're just coming out of a bottom. You got to give these things time to work out because you can be selling monsters way too early. I remember buying shop at like 40 something bucks when it first broke out. And it went to 60 in like a flash and I sold most of it, patting myself on the back like I'm a, a genius. And the thing went to hmm, Mars, like a thousand yeah. plus bucks years later. It's like, good job, dummy. <laughs> Tell you, Richard, I do stupid stuff all the time. We all do. <laughs> um, but I, I assume you're, you're not just jumping into that size right away. You're building into that. Um, but talk about your maybe your, your, your first buy, what percentage of that total final position is that? And as, as it makes progress for you, how do you manage those add-on buys? If I get a shakeout and there's a really tight area, if the area is wide and loose. Yeah. Uh, that's hard to manage risk in. Yes, but if you have yes. a really tight area and you get a shakeout and then like right back in, I'm more inclined to be a little more aggressive on that first buy. Yeah. So if you know, I'm targeting like a 30% full position of my account and a name, um, then maybe I'll do like 10 or 15% of it right off the bat in that type of situation. But if gotcha. it's, if it's a sketchy, you know, wide and loose pattern, I might not be inclined to even, I mean, even if it's only like three to 5%, it's like, who, and it goes up without you, who cares? You got something, right? Um, right. So I, I found out so many times where you think you've got a winner and you you see price move up one day, you're like, this is it. This is the day it goes to the moon. You put like, you know, a third of your account in it right off the bat. And then the next day there's some sort of reversal and you get stopped out. And you're like, well, crap, you know, that was yeah. dumb. So, you know, you just, this is stuff you learn over time. Um, you know, the, 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 for people starting out, you want money now, you want big money. And, and, you know, the, the, the thought of, you know, making it rich right off the bat is so appealing, but again, like for the 900th time, this stuff takes time and you just got to ease into it and, and, and let it do its work. So it was a good question. Awesome. All right. FLGT. So that was one earlier this year. Um, so this is like a perfect example for one of, you know, Minervini's vol volatility contraction panels or panels patterns, um, I would say. So, you know, you got your initial run up, you kind of come back down here in September, you start vacillating around. So supply hits the market, buyers step in at a higher price than prior, right? You get a little double, double bottom shakeout here. It's not a huge one, but it's little. Again, you want to see these shakeouts throughout the base because, because they create some fuel and, you know, they, these institutions don't want weak holders, yeah. Um, holding the stock when this thing finally gets ready to go. They want everybody, all the week, what, what's the new Wall Street bets? Stuff, paper hand, or di not diamond hands, yep, but yep. paper hand. I, mean, I can't even, I feel like I'm getting old. I don't even know the terminology anymore, but paper, you want the paper hands gone and, and done away with before the, the, the move happens. So um, again, it vacillates back up, supply hits higher lows, higher lows, and then you break out. And so this is another lesson in, in buying late. You don't want to buy late leave your FOMO at the door. Um, there's volume coming into the breakout because this next day, if you were to buy late up here, you're just going to get slammed down. So that goes from 70 down to like high 50. That's a pretty brutal, you know, it doesn't look like much on the chart, but that's a pretty nasty, you know, shape. Right. Um, so you buy right and sit tight is the saying, right? So, um, and this kind of vacillates up. It creates this channel again, which is usually bearish, uh, but it just eviscerates it and puts in a super move. Um, you know, it goes from, 
you know, 50 to 150. And then it has like a final blow off. So that you can just tell this things, you want to buy, you want to try and buy tight and, and sell them when they get extended and wide and yeah. loose. I mean, that's the goal. And you do that over and over, you repeat. Um, you know, this is, this is like an example of, of having an edge and, and following process. You want to buy stuff like this and not buy, you know, way up here when it's laid and then you get smashed around. And you want to stack things in your favor and just do it over and over, repeat it. You're going to have losses, sure but just make sure they're small and, and, and you stick to your plan and, and just do this repeatedly over and over. And, and, and it, compounding is like the, the eighth wonder of the world. Somebody said, right. It's just amazing how it works. So, and then it's just been dog crap ever since it has parabolic law. The earnings it had here were super. They're up like a thousand percent, 900 percent, but the street didn't care. It closed near the lows. There was already baked in in this prior move up. So again, the market's forward looking. Um, it already anticipated huge, earnings just due to the COVID testing and all that. So, um, and this thing's just toast. I mean, maybe it tries to resume, but the, the meat of the bone is, the, the meat's off the bone and, and that's all she wrote, so. And um, how are you managing the position after you've got that established? Um, because this is a par parabolic move. What are you doing in terms of stop losses, selling it to strength? Um, can you talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah, so um, you, you can buy out of here. Yeah. But I think I maybe tried it this day and it came back below and that's so common like i mean yeah. the best stocks will just rip out of there yeah. like i have an example of like a perfect breakout um in a minute but but more times than not this is normal like you'll you'll get the breakout i'll come back and you know they call it the squat right so you'll squat but then like the next day it completely recovers so you can buy um you know the next day i wouldn't i mean this is where you want to buy you want to buy as close assuming you didn't already get in over here and just waited it out you want to buy as close to the pivot as possible. And then you just sit. Yep. Um, so you just kind of let it do its thing. It's just breaking out. It's a nice, what's that? Six months or so, six month base. Um, you know, the market's still firing in all cylinders and just give it time to vacillate around. I, you know, you can, I, you start, when it starts getting above this channel, that's when you start reducing. Cause then especially here, you know, you just know it's, it's starting its later stage move. I mean, I didn't even think I stuck around for this day. Yeah. Um, this is like, you know, this is just why again, huge volume, uh, the biggest bar of the move. It's just classic exhaustion um, signals. And, you know, you just have a good move. It's like 50 bucks to, I mean, I didn't hold up here, 50 to 150. I mean, oh, even if it went to 50 to 70, that's a great move, Nick, 40%. Right. And <laughs> so, um, again, just do this over and over. And again, you don't need huge, move. like this was a home run for people that held the whole way up, but you don't need that. I mean, just compound you know, like Mark says, 10, 20, 30% gains over and over, and, and you can do just, just fine. Gotcha. All right. So food two, um, this is a great example of a, um, you know, a, like a Livermore shakeout. So you got the prior kind of base here, um, you know, it breaks out kind of lower highs, lower highs. It finally gives way below the initial breakout spot. So people probably give up on it, right? So it's sitting here, was that one, two, three, three days, four days or less below the channel, eyes are off it. Um, and then this day it pops right back in. So this is what I was talking about. When, when you get a pop right back in, you, know, you shake out some weak hands, boom, right back in. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you can start, I think I bought this day here. Um, and then the next day you get continuation past the trend line. You could have bought here a little bit if you wanted. It was like a cherry on top. And then the thing moves from, what is that? 40 to almost 60. And I sold it here like a putt thinking, oh, it's you know over this channel line. and and um, you know, the move is done. And then it went from, you know, 50 something to 130. Yeah. <laughs> and then again, these patterns repeat that the biggest volume bar, the biggest range at the end of the move, mm -hmm. closing off the highs is just classic exhaustion. Um, and then, you know, gathered itself, final parabolic, came back down. Is there some, this is some wide action up here. Came back yeah. down for a, a double top at the round 200 level. These psychological round levels are, are usually good resistance areas. And, and, you know, Livermore will talk about, you know, the first time through a, through, a, you know, a century mark, let's say, um, maybe, maybe you don't get much traction. Like they call it the first mouse, second mouse, the first mouse goes for the cheese, gets his head chopped off. You know, the second mouse comes and just takes the cheese because all the hard work's out of the way. First right. mouse is the, uh, the martyr. And so you'll see a lot of that too with breakouts. Don't give up on a breakout if, if a first mouse gets smashed. Yeah. Because that second mouse can be 
the most powerful thing you've ever seen. So never give uh, never give up on a breakout if you see it fail for the first time because it could repair itself and then work back up. Everybody's got their eyes off it. They forget about it because sometimes when there's too many eyes on it, you know, it's so obvious. You know, the market likes to play cruel uh, tricks on people and, and make it hard. So usually the stealthy names that nobody are following with the best patterns are, are good to buy. But you can just see since then, it's just been so wide. This is wide and loose price action is not ideal. And, you know, finally, you know, I was watching this one for a while. I did buy it out of here finally. Yeah. And so it rips up to, you know, almost 180. Like, oh, we're going back to 200. We're creating another base and we're going to go to, you know, 300. And, and then I made a funny comment, like, welcome to 2021. Just boom, offerings. Yep. See you later. That's all she wrote. Here's like a little H fake down. I mean, this thing, they had an offering. The price was like 130. It's struggling to stay above it. And I'm not a great sign. I mean, it's just, you can just tell, it's just, look at all this distribution hitting and it's just, it's good to lay off this and, and just uh, ignore it and, and move on to the next. But it was a nice super move and I missed most of it, but I caught some of it at least. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of food too, because this, this kind of goes in hands, hands in hand with, uh, I think, uh, a problem that I experienced this year and a lot of people are struggling with. A lot of people are focused on the pins, the, the, the fast leads of last year, uh, when we, we should be kind of moving on to kind of what's working right now, which unfortunately is oil, gas, and, and steel. Um, what are your thoughts on kind of... Um, or how do you wrap your head around like always be looking for the new merchandise and the stocks that are working? What, what's kind of your advice for that? Always, always be flexible. It's like, yeah. uh, who said it? Was it, um, was it Paul Tudor Jones? He says adapt or die. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, that applies here. Cause yeah. when you have these massive, like the zooms of the world, the pitons, yeah. uh, F E R R, um, the COVID really ramped up. I mean, these things were already on their way yeah. to becoming great, but COVID just accelerated that by years. Yeah. And so some of these moves were just astronomical and, and huge. And so when you get these massive moves, it's going to take time for them to set And some of them never come back, right? You, you see like Cisco from 20 years ago, it still hasn't gotten back to where it, it was prior. And, and people get fixated on them because they knew that's what was working. Um, and they and you short side yourself. I mean, I'll be honest, I wasn't really looking at, um, I like trading like these exciting names, but I wasn't buying a lot of these um, old leaders back, but I was spending too much time on them. I mean, I would come yeah. through every chart, but buying a gold chart or a steel chart may not be, uh, or an oil chart may not be exciting, but you can still make some pretty good, like back in 06, was it 06 or 07? Yeah. Some of these oil yeah. names were amazing moves, like rig, like Transocean, Diamond Offshore. Those are some stellar moves. Um, but you always have to be flexible. Uh, you always have to keep an open mind. Don't get stuck in with tunnel vision. Um, you got to be flexible and adapt. For sure. All right. This is a rare time where I would trade a single digit stock. So Tiger... Same group as Food 2. It's like the ugly stepsister compared to Food 2. Food 2 had some great earnings, whether you yeah. believe them or not. You know, China's, uh, you always got to be careful with some of the China names. And I mean, there's so many companies in China. They all can't be frauds. I mean, come on. But still, um, all it takes is one uh, LK or, or whatnot to uh, ruin your year. So you always got to, you can buy them, but just uh, uh, manage risk accordingly. So yeah. this was one, this was a total pips week stock. It made a huge move. And when I IPO from seven to low twenties and then we just did nothing for months. Mm -hmm. And it was just kind of creating this nice stage one base and volume. I think it caught my attention here when like massive volume came in for whatever reason. Um, I don't know what the deal was there, but then it didn't get far kind of vastly around, but you can kind of tell this initial IPO low um, mm -hmm. is usually a critical spot. So, you know, it's tried a couple of times with not much success. And so finally, it was this, it poked above a couple of times, but I bought this week um, just because it's such a massive pattern. Um, the bigger, again, the bigger the pattern, the bigger the potential move. And look at this, this move down here. There's zero um, ledge of, of support and resistance built up. It's just a fast move down. So once you get into this zone, it could go up just as fast in the other direction. So that's why I was kind of eyeing it. Um, and so it made a super move right back to highs. And if I go into the daily, um, so as it was making its move, you could draw a line here, like, okay, here's a, a trend line. 
here's a good example when it overshoots, it kind of stalls out and then it gets a little wide and loose again. And so you're kind of like, oh, it's still, still sluggish up here, it's struggling. And then it kind of comes down. Mm -hmm. And I love these, like this kind of setup right here, I love. It's kind of like the Tesla setup. I and mean, this thing just broke out, it just broke out. And it's kind of got like that little H look to it. Yeah. And so people are probably thinking, oh, this is this is toast, this is the end. So um, one of my mentors always said, just when you think the trend will end, bet that it won't. Because <laughs> the mm -hmm. trend is the most powerful force in the market, it really is. Um, you know, some of these, I don't trend, but commodity, like the trends in commodities sometimes, it's just, they're just insane. Yeah. So, you know, you get a little shake down here, it came back up, I started nibbling right in here. And then you can add as it gets its bearings the next day, breaks the trend line, and then it goes from, you know, 17 to, uh, what is that, 30 something. Again, you can kind of tell it's getting wider and looser up here. Just draw your trend lines, your O'Neill trend lines, breaches the top, gets slammed down, comes back up for a double top into the trend line retest, and then that was all she wrote. And then, you know, got smoked, comes back up to the initial IPO high, gets smoked, comes back down, wedges up back to it again, gets smoked, but technical analysis doesn't work, people say. So what are you going to do? I'm kidding. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Yeah, <laughs> completely agree. Um, we're, we're looking at a weekly chart right now. Um, how do you use different multiple time frames when you're analyzing stocks? And, and also when you're actually going ahead, watching that breakout, watching that pivot, um, what time frames are you looking at? So you always, my weekend work is week, uh, uh, weekly only. Weekly only, um, interesting. Um, there's There's been so many, I mean, I'll start with the weekly on the weekend, but I'll drill into the daily to yeah. see, you know, what, what else is behind, behind, beneath the surface. But um, you don't want to miss the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm. So I think I alluded to it earlier. Yeah, you know, I've made so many stupid decisions in the past. Um, you know, I, oh, there's a bearish 30 minute reversal pattern setting up and you sell your position or you reduce it. And then you pull up a daily or weekly and there's nothing wrong with it at all. It's still an uptrend. There's absolutely no red flags whatsoever, but you're zooming into like some pipsqueak time frame. So weekly trumps all, monthly trumps weekly, right? You always want to kind of, so when I do the weekend analysis, you're, are we trending or not basically is what I want to find out because I want to buy stocks that are trending in an uptrend and you yeah. just avoid them uh, completely. Unless you're good at shorting, you can shorten stage four um, declines. I'm horrible at shorting. The only short, uh, type of setup I like is when you get a parabolic move and then you get a gap down and then it kind of bear flags up into that parabolic move. Those can be some super duper short uh, setups. You get some fast plunges from those. But other than that, I don't really short. So you want to make sure, hey, is my stock in an uptrend or not? And that's like step one. Um, so, you know, my weekend work is always starting with the weekly. And then if I need to go investigate further, I'll, I'll drill into the daily. Um, but my buy decisions are usually based on daily. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'll zoom into like a, a 60 minute chart um, and, you know, maybe get like a little cheap buy or whatever to kind of zoom in, but 60 minutes, usually the lowest I'll go. Gotcha. And these aren't like, these aren't like high quality names, by the way. I'm just giving a few examples, like yeah. Tiger, JI, <laughs> these aren't your uh, typical, uh, you know, Googles of yesteryear or whatnot. But um, so this one, this is just an example of, it's not really a base breakout, but um, you know, again, this did nothing for months. IPO yeah. way the hell back here. Um, and it's just basing doing nothing, nothing. Oh, some volumes coming in here, it gets slammed down, nothing, nothing. And then you start to see, you know, these volume shoots down here. It's like, okay, well, maybe somebody's accumulating something. And so, you know, I put this one on the, the watch list, maybe around here. Or so, <laughs> pardon me. And, you know, it broke out. I missed this part. But again, to my point, Stocks love to retest. Um, mm -hmm. Don't have FOMO. If you buy up here, you're getting smoked. And, and this was one um, where, you know, it came down, I think that was to the penny. So I was, this was one I was watching because I think the market was getting smoked that day. And I had it high up on my list and it came all the way down, tagged it. And it, 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 I think it jumped like 80 cents to a dollar within like two seconds. And so wow. I, instantly bought. I mean, that's like that hot stove reaction. You don't want something to retest and just sit there lifeless, right? You want that beach ball underwater action, uh, your tennis ball action. And so that was what I bought right around here. And then I think I maybe sold it maybe the next day because it just kind of vacillated around. It was just a quick trade, but um, you know, that's, you know, 25 bucks to 33. It's not, that's not bad. You know, it's better than a sharp stick in the eye. So 
<laughs> and then again, so the, so another thing I like to share is like these rising channels. When you get a rising channel into a prior high, I hate those. I hate those mm -hmm. with the passion. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes they'll work at volume. Volume, um, you know, if you get volume coming in, that can eviscerate the pattern. But more times than not, I found that if you get a rising channel into these prior highs, it, it's going to need some time to work off, maybe flatten out and then repair itself before it gets going again. But um, and then this one, you know, create a little wedge here you could have bought out of if you wanted to, another little flag. But again, it's getting a little bit looser and wider up here than over here. And so you can start drawing trend lines as you get clues and, and build it out. And, and it didn't really, there's like so much wick. Look at all this wick here above the trend line. Wick, 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 wick. It can't get out of its own way. There's so many sellers at the 60, 70 range. And so that's, you know, if you're in it, that's probably a good, um, a good kind of <laughs> thing that you had multiple days to pick it up. It's not like it happened in one day and then it just plunged. I mean, there was yeah. multiple days where it's just rejecting. So it's taught, the market's talking to you and you got to listen to it. So then it plunged, came right back down to the highs. They're like, yay, we're reclaiming. And then nope. And just dog shit sense. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of these names are never going to come back. Um, like these, these stocks that have been, you know, had super moves last year and, and these things are, already down 50, 60%, some of them down 70%. I mean, maybe like Tesla is like a rare exception when it has parabolic move back in February. Um, you know, that came back and built out a super base and kept going. Um, but many of these things are just just toast and, and, and done for and you just don't bother looking at them. Maybe they're good for a quick trade here and there. Like if you're maybe watching this one, you can draw a wedge and shake out the wedge and rip back up, maybe get a quick, quick trade or two. But in terms of prolonged moves and swings, um, you know, forget about it. You got to be quick with these. So, mm -hmm. um, so CPE was one I bought. Um, and so this was a, a nice, I mean, I missed this move because we was paying attention to other things and in, in fed time frame. but this was a nice, you know, another example of a potential like BCP that Mark talks about, you get a little shake here, a little shake here, a little shake. So it's contracting, vacillating back and forth, contracting. Um, you know, I think a little after it kind of, you know, I think I bought this day because I kept testing this, what is that, uh, 37 level. Mm -hmm. And I bought some here this day, went up to 40. And you're like, okay, good. And then that day it gapped down to uh, <laughs> put a little scare into it, like 30 something. It mm -hmm. gapped right to support, a little shake. And then it was straight up from there. Yeah. So, and then the next day, you know, it broke. It was that like yesterday. It broke out. And then, you know, welcome to this market, boom, mm -hmm. right back down. <laughs> um, the thing too, I've, I've found over the years with energy stocks is um, you really got to get them on, on the pullback. They're kind of tough, tough to, to get on a period. You can't buy these things like it's, you know, Amazon coming out of a 1998 base, really. Mm -hmm. like, there's so many games with the energy names. It's, um, I mean, here it would have worked, but, you know, over time I've, I've learned that you got to really buy those things on pullbacks. So that was another one that, um, is, a, is reminiscent of um, exactly what this market is doing to breakout buyers. So, and are you are you taking some profits on that breakout day uh, because of this market? Is that kind of I, how I you're did. Adapting? I, I I was willing to give it some room because if you pull up a weekly, it was almost like a high type flag. You can't see it yeah. here, but high type flag on top of a high type flag. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, there's a saying like stocks and double like to double again. Yeah. And you know, commodities you know trend strong usually, and um, so I was I was hoping it would stick. And it went to 46 and then it was kind of losing a, like an hourly pattern. And, and so I, I sold, I sold most of it because the rest of the market's selling off. This is kind of like the last man standing and yeah. the group and they come for everybody. They come for the generals. Like when it's all said and done, they'll come for every group. And, and, you know, all my breakout attempts prior weren't working. So I wasn't going to try and pick the time where um, <laughs> this was the exception when it started working. So I just said, you know, what, I'm, I'm out and, and then luckily, you know, I avoided this gap down. But again, who knows? Maybe this takes some time to digest some more. And then you get a nice second mouse breakout. Um, yep. So don't don't look away from it. Just keep it on, on watch. But just right now, it's um, not working out. Mm -hmm. But this one was, I didn't buy this one, but this was a good example of one exactly what you want to see in a breakout. Um, I don't even know what this name is. I think it's been around for a while. I don't even know if it has good earnings or not. But the, the price action the other day got me to it. But this is just a good example of, you know, a nice little base here. You can draw your little channel line and and here's like a mini channel on the base. It slams down, closes near dead lows. And, you know, you're thinking, oh, it's probably going to come back and test. And then I think this is for earnings. 
and then it just completely gapped the channel top right near yeah. the prior high and just ripped right on out of there. And then you get a day two rip to this is exactly what you want to see in a breakout. You get a one that one two punch because when you get that one two punch, more times than not, you you know you probably have a, a decent chance of having a winner on your hands. And you know, I got slammed down um, you know, the third day, but then this is a potential, you know, beach ball reversal down here. It comes back, it doesn't quite retest all the way, but you know, maybe this is one to to keep an eye, you can maybe draw like a little like flag channel here and see if it builds out. But um, I don't know the company that well, but this is just a good example of a of a technical breakout, what you want to see on a good one. So, um, and then Best Buy, I mean, this is the kind of crap we have to like start watching right in this market. It's like Office Depot's Best Buy. <laughs> but I mean, it's actually a pretty decent little base. I mean, it's kind of a wider range. It's not really tight, but it's just kind of vacillating around. And, you know, mm -hmm. down here, you got a little, 2B shakeout, at least a little channel break, it runs up. And again, here's that rising trend line into prior highs. I hate those. And lo and behold, it, you know, it gets smacked right back down. Here's another shakeout. And so you're getting some shakes in here. Um, and it actually had a nice little, you know, this is an area where you could have bought um, like a little cheat before you get to the main breakout. And then it broke out yesterday and then, you know, <laughs> right back down. But um, also too, you can kind of look at a stock's history. Like this is a pretty big move. This is a pretty big three-day move for the stock. So if you look at history, like if you get big three-day moves, I don't really see any. Like here's one here, but then it stalls out and then slam down. So you, it's good to look at a stock's personality because each of these stocks has its own uh, temperament. They have their own way of moving. Um, so it's good to know, you know how they move. If you were to buy a little late up here, I mean, that's a pretty good move for the stock from like 118 to, you know, it's like a 10 buck move, which is like 100 in Tesla terms. <laughs> so um, you just have to be aware of how your stocks move because they each have, they each have their own personalities, as I was mentioning. So um, this was another good one today, Suave. I didn't buy this, but um, this is like an example of relative strength. So right at the gap down uh, on the market today, uh, I think it had earnings. So again, it looks like this thing's toast. It's failing the breakout, closing right on the dead lows. And then it just gaps and reclaims right at that breakout spot, right at the open, breaks the trend line. And it's a massive volume. And so you know, kind of stalled out the prior high here. So I may need to like flatten out a little bit if it's even going to continue further, who knows. But this is a good example of, of stuff you should be watching for on a day like today where, um, you know, maybe the market's getting smashed at the open, but you want to see what's working well and, and, and sticking and throw that kind of stuff on your watch list. And then HD was a good example of one I missed. I didn't, again, I, my Heinz, my crystal ball is still in the shop and broken, so I missed this one. My hindsight account killed it, though. So <laughs> this is a good example of, you know, shakeouts leading to fast moves. So, like, you get a nice little, I wouldn't call it a flag, but a nice little descending channel. Um, you get a shakeout here. All the weak hands are left left, uh, left for dead and then just ripped right back in this thing. This is a massive move for this one, too. 250 to 350. I mean, that's super duper. Um, if you catch the, you know, the, the shake and back in, this is the kind of stuff I look for for like my first kind of buy. Um, so it's just another example of, of things I look for as well. But this is kind of getting tired up here. Um, so, you know, it's just probably uh, good to stay away from it for a while. So I, I want to get into, I know we're getting a little long on time, but I do want to get into like a couple IPO precedents. So, mm -hmm. um, so with coin, this one kind of reminds me, and I, I drew the line here before it closed at the high of the day. So this thing, you know, it's been nowhere but down ever since the IPO. And it reminds me of Facebook in a way because there's so much hype with the Facebook IPO when it first came out and it just, you know, cratered from there. This is no different. You know, crypto has been on fire yeah. and, um, you know, Ethereum, Bitcoin, all that stuff. Uh, and then it's just, you know, there's so much hype. The only place it goes down. And so it just got smashed. But it's actually created this nice little channel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and finally, a volume came in. Uh, this is a pretty tight day. So you, you, you can, if you want to be super aggressive, you probably could have bought close to this, you know, channel bottom here. Um, but you don't want to just buy as the things like falling in price. You at least want to make sure there's some sort of intraday setup where it's like turning yeah. back up an hourly or whatnot. Um, and then so it broke the channel yesterday. It gapped right down to the retest. It actually shook it a little bit right down to the channel retest and straight up again. So this could be something to put on watch um i think it has earnings uh tomorrow or the next day um but this would be might be a good candidate this is, this reminds me exactly of let me go to uh of baba's ipo mm -hmm. so let me scratch this up and path as well was another recent ipo that that showed some good rs today i'm watching yep. that one 
so this, I mean, this looks eerily similar yeah. to the um, the coin. This, granted, this channel angle isn't as steep, so maybe yeah. there's some more overhead to chew through. But this is the kind of, same kind of thing. This one actually undercut when Baba went IPO. Uh, it got rejected down. Um, I think coin closed above its yesterday, and then you get that one, two, three breakout, and it goes from you know 90 to. 120. That's a pretty good move. I mean, if you catch those over time that you're doing something right. So this precedent, I like to look at IPO like turns, if you will, like mm -hmm. I have four examples also skip them because um, we're pressed for time, but um, Google had a super IPO turn like this Tilray, um, you know, had a great one. eBay had a great one. So if you guys go back and look at these old charts, those are good examples of, of IPO turns. Um, I wanted to close the charting session by kind of looking at um, what, I'm kind of seeing in, in old leader land. Um, so a lot of these stocks are just incredibly wide and loose. I mean, this yeah. is a, this this is just not ideal. I mean, this Piton, like look at look how nice and controlled and tight, and look mm -hmm. how wide and loose this is losing on like huge volume. Maybe it comes back. Like this could be a good short entry. Maybe it who knows? Maybe it recovers and and comes back and reclaims. Um, but, you know, if this comes back to this line and, and retests and, and weakens from that, it could be a good short uh, opportunity. Um, you know, ARC, uh, this actually could be, um, let me go to a daily. This actually could be a shakeout today. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been dogging it because this, this fund is kind of filled with yesteryear's um, leaders. But like, look at this big reversal today. I mean, this could be the start of reclaiming the pattern and, and people have just been talking so much crap on Kathy. I mean, yeah. if I can't give you a word of advice, it's, uh, it's like that kind of stuff, like bashing other people, it only makes you look like a total douchebag. <laughs> it looks, makes you look more like a douchebag than, than, uh, than the person you're trying to put down. So um, be nice to people, be kind, like, especially like anybody that tries to do, you know, investing, this is a hard game. Um, I have the utmost respect for people that, 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 you know, put the effort in to try and learn this because it's it's not easy. And so be kind to people. You want to see people do well, be happy mm -hmm. for people when they do well. And so all right, I'll, that's all I need to say about that. But this could be a potential shakeout. So everybody's bearish as can be with, with ARC and maybe, who knows, maybe we reclaim and, and it bases out some more. And, you know, maybe it's good for a trade or two, but um, I think the best days are behind a lot of these like FERR, who's in a huge trend line, like a wide and loose. This is not ideal price action. Um, docu looks horrible to me. It's holding in there still, but I mean, look how wide and loose this is. This, is, this reminds me of the EHTH EH or the eHealth chart from last year, which is just horrible. Yeah. It's just so incredibly, it was a super move, but this is just so bad. I mean, this is exactly what you don't want to see. Um, this is classic distribution. And so on these kinds of things, I'm avoiding maybe there's new leadership coming through um, that we can keep an eye on in the next, you know, a few months, but. I mean, if you look at the indexes from a, a bigger picture perspective, mm -hmm. um, look how far we've come. Um, here's like the 2013 breakout. I mean, we're getting pretty, this is parabolic basically. So I, can we still go another 10, 20% higher? Sure, anything's, anything's possible in the market. But this is why it's been so tough recently because there's, there's not a lot of meat left on the bone in terms of an index perspective. And so things have been quick. Um, if you're quick enough, you've been doing great. Uh, I, I've been, you know, terrible in this market. I just kind of stay out and I've tried a few things and just getting paper cuts. And so it's just not for me, but I mean, look at some of these monthly charts of, of some of these moves. Mm -hmm. I mean, here is rut. You get the contraction, the base breakout, you know, it has a huge shake back down to the round thousand level. You know, you're starting to get extended here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some O'Neill channel, you know, exhaustion. And um, so I, I'm kind of on guard a little bit. I mean, here's the, uh, NAS, the NDX. I mean, this is like some steep stuff. So, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me if, well, nothing surprised me. You gotta be ready for anything. Anything can happen in the market, but um, you wanna buy out of tight price action, right? And, and sell it when it's kind of already ran and gone. And so this to me just tells me, we just need a lot of time to, to repair. And, and maybe once we have some more time, um, you know, new things will set up, new leaders will emerge and you just gotta be patient and stick to, uh, stick to your watch list and, and keep your eyes open for stuff. So, but yeah, that's just kind of a, uh, my thought process when I look at charts and I try to keep it simple. Um, you know, it's just simple trend lines, shakeouts. That's all you really need. Um, if you want to, you know, throw in your own flair of um, some other indicator, like one thing I don't have on here, but I do like looking at is um, 
you know, volume profile, that's a good another layer to add on. If there's like a massive ledge and, you know, price uses that as support, that, that's something that's, you know, certainly helpful. But um, again, it's just price action, it's volume, it's super duper earnings, and, and that's all you need. I mean, this stuff takes, takes time to put the package together, but once you do, um, you know, I'll never forget, um, you know, Dan, I went to one of his seminars a while ago, and you know, he went to one of Williams a long time ago, and, and, and he said, William, the first thing William said at his seminar was, if you do your homework, you'll have more money than you know what to do with. And I will never forget that. Um, that's ingrained into my head. And, and so for the people out there that are, you know, struggling, like I said, don't give up, don't ever give up. I mean, if something's worth fighting for, keep at it. There are brighter days ahead. And, and um, you know, anybody can do this. I'm no, you don't need a PhD in any of this stuff. Um, you just need to put in the work though. It does take time. Um, you know, how bad do you want it? Um, you get out what you put in, just like anything in life, but it's certainly doable. Um, I mean, we're so lucky to be, you know, in a world where innovation's always coming up with something new. There's always going to be new companies coming out. So mm -hmm. you know, if, don't get discouraged if we go through a rough, rough patch because that's just normal market activity and, and it, you know, things don't go straight to the moon every single day and just be patient and, and uh, good things can come of it. So keep at it. Awesome. And yeah, I noticed that you didn't have any moving averages on your chart. So I was going to ask you about that, but yeah, it's nice, clean, even, even the, you don't even color the, the different bars based on the, no, I, I interesting. try to just dump, I, again, I might, I'm not a very smart guy. I don't think I'm very smart. There's, there's people like, like, uh, like I'll trade ideas. I think it's good too, to like my best friends, like we'll have a, you know, a little powwow session, share ideas. And, mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, a lot of people probably don't have a ton of friends that do this stuff. Um, but, you know, it's good to kind of share ideas with other people. Like, um, you know, after last year's competition, like I you know, got to meet like people like Matt and, and Oliver yeah. and like once every week or every other week, we'll share ideas. And it's good to kind of bounce ideas off each other. Those guys run circles around me, by the way, in terms of market knowledge. But uh, so I, I just, for my dumb self, I just like to keep it dumb and, and keep it simple. Um, you know, my small pea sized brain uh, processes it better that way when it's just simple trend lines and monitoring you know, support shakes, supply and demand and, and all that good stuff. So um, again, there's a million ways to skin a cat, but uh, in this game, but whatever works for you. Um, at the end of the day, all that matters is did you make money or not? And so how you got there doesn't really matter. It's just, you know, what's the end result at the end of the day. So just my two cents. Absolutely. And I think you're 100% selling yourself short, Ryan, <laughs> on that front, but um, yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I always like to end it with, and, and you kind of already touched on this, but uh, what advice do you have for people just starting out and want to accelerate their learning curve, uh, maybe not even just on the technical analysis side of things, but also on the, the discipline, the mindset, psychological side, what, what advice do you have for new traders? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, if you have goals in mind, don't just keep them in your head. I, I think writing down goals is, is great. Like for example, I have something put up on my wall over here. It says, are you closer to your dream today? And it sounds stupid and corny, but for me, it's a good reminder that, um, you know, if I'm about to do something dumb or like make a dumb purchase or sell something prematurely, um, it's like, hey, is this getting you to where you need to be uh, to be the best person you can be? And so, you know, setting simple goals, uh, even if it's short term goals, you have longer term goals, short term goals, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be investing related, you know, anything in life, write them down. Um, I feel like that's more helpful than just telling yourself in your head, you're going to do it. Um, surround yourself with positive people. Yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, it does you no good to put down other folks. <laughs> it just makes you look really bad. And that's just my two cents. But, um, you know, support yourself with positive people who want to see you do well. You know, share with them your goals um, and, you know, surround yourself with people that are maybe smarter than yourself so they can kind of help you get to where you need to go. Um, and, you know, again, there's no such thing as a guru in this market, it just comes down to how much preparation you put in. Um, and if you love it bad enough, then the only result will be that you will succeed and, and it'll get done. And, um, and, and, and again, the last thing I'll, I'll end with is, is never give up. Um, there were so many times where I wanted to give up when I first started, you doubt yourself, you wonder if, if it's possible. Um, but again, it just takes so much, so much time. And if you put in the time and you're patient, then, you know, the sky is the limit. So don't ever give up and, and believe in yourself and only great things will happen. I love that. And, and this was, this entire thing was fantastic, Ryan. Thank, thank you so much for coming on and, and giving us your time and, and, and talking through your mindset, technical analysis, all of that. So uh, yeah, thanks so much. Um, we really appreciate having you on. 
Hey, thanks a lot, Richard. Thanks for having me again. And, and like I said, I'm humbled and, and sorry for my terrible delivery. I'm sure there's, you know, Dale Carnegie's rolling over in his grave <laughs> right about now. But um, again, I want to say you're doing a fantastic job uh, with everything that you've built. I mean, keep up the great work. I saw the other day you, you put on there that you're speaking into existence, that you'll have uh, your army built to a million. But I was going to say, don't sell yourself short. You should uh, aim for one and a half million and uh, go from there. So, we'll so do. keep I'll... up the great work. You have a fantastic channel and and it's just remarkable what you've built. And so keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'll put that on my wall right over there just because you just because you said it. Awesome. Uh, for everybody watching, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Ryan was fantastic. Um, if you did like the video, go ahead and leave a like down below and subscribe if you want to see more great interviews like with Ryan here. Um, and we'll see you guys in future videos. Thanks.